Hi, my name is Nacho. Welcome back to our channel. And don't you ever feel like we live in a constant state of deja vu? I can't begin to count how many adaptations of animated movies and shows I've watched in the past couple of years, and it's gotten to the point where hearing the words upcoming live action adaptation just automatically sends a signal from my ears, through my brain, and into my eyes that says roll. The latest kid on the block, no pun intended, is the Avatar. No, not the one with the blue people like King Leong thought he was auditioning for. I'm talking about Nickelodeon's Avatar The Last Airbender. A classic TV show that most of us grew up with that walks the mighty line of being an American show while being compared to anime, given how good it actually is. So I pinched the whole series as fast as I could, which was probably not very fast. Every second YouTuber and their mothers already posted a review, but I did my best. So how does the new live action compare to the original and the uh, M. Night Shyamalan attempt of a movie? To put it simply, imagine you have three sprinters. One is a 12-year-old ADHD fat kid who wandered too far into the racetrack looking for a food truck and ended up signed up to a 100 meter race. That's the M. Night Shyamalan movie. Next to him is a beautiful female athlete that does rather well considering the competition. That's the Netflix adaptation. And finally, Next to her is a 6 foot 4, 200 pound Jamaican Olympic champion with a couple of world records under his belt. That's the original cartoon. It absolutely smokes the other two without even breaking a sweat. But all jokes aside, is the new show really that bad? The short answer is no. If you ever watch the original cartoon, you're gonna like the new show. It's very pretty in terms of visuals. The CGI is decent in some parts and really good in others. The one scene in particular where Aang freezes himself in the ocean is pretty sick. Costumes look good. The bending of air and fire looks nice, with some weak points when it comes to earth and water. Small locations look pretty detailed, and the big shots of cities and the spirit realm, which are obviously generated, look alright, but I'm not gonna shed on them because they present the scenery better than other shows. The story goes super fast with some long monologues to fill out for the cutout content, although they do it in a somewhat effective manner. The casting for certain characters is so good. I never imagined Daniel Day Kim to look that ripped at 55. Confirmed. Vampire. The casting of Iroh was brilliant. Gordon Cormier as Aang, although a bit stiff with some lines, plays a great airbender. There are some hotties like oh Maria Sang my. as Suki, Amber Midthunder from Prey as Princess Yue, and Arden Cho with a brief appearance as June the Bounty Hunter. Katara and Sokka, despite the rumored changes to his misogynistic traits, played their relationship as brothers very well, much like their bonding with Aang. To which I'll come back in a second, but overall, I really liked them, much like what Ian Owsley did with Sokka who was a very pleasant comedic relief. A couple of good things, but that's for someone who's never watched the show. But what happens if you have? Well, if that's the case, you'll start noticing the input from the creative team that was implemented in the show right from episode 1. By far the biggest offender is the fact that Aang can fly. Not just with his glider, he can levitate himself much like Sahir did in The Legend of Korra. A little bit of lore is necessary since that is not a common ability that airbenders have and can only be achieved when the user severs all earthly binds and thus become free to fly. Aang can't do that. So that was included for nothing more than the wow factor and he doesn't even use it that much after that. Again, something you'd only notice if you watch the original show. But another group that apparently are also able to fly are the firebenders. During the assault on the air temple and that literally caught me by surprise because they literally boosted themselves like rockets. Now for short distance, like Suko doing his spinning kicks while bending which allow him to jump a little bit higher than normal, sure, but these guys clear a whole ass mountain. Why even bother with the war balloons? Just give the boys a couple fresh pair of boots and presto, you got an air force. Also, since this is a shorter adaptation, the Netflix show runs for about 6 hours, whereas the cartoon run for about 8, cutting intros and outros. So there's a considerable amount of content that was cut, and when you watch it, it becomes really evident. During the visit to the Air Temple, where Aang finds the body of Gyatso, in the OG series, there's some bonding between when Katara finds Aang for the first time and when they arrive at the Air Temple. You can spot the difference on how she helps him calm down in the cartoon by telling him how they consider him family and how Aang calms himself down in the live action, reflecting as well how many other of the relationships in the show play out. Suki falls in love with Sokka almost at first sight, which means he doesn't really go through his arc of recognizing the Kyoshi warriors as equals, letting go of his you're just a girl attitude and even wearing their makeup. 
but instead he trains a little bit with Suki and that's pretty much enough for him to learn their fighting style and make them acknowledge their feelings and have a big smooch at the end. So getting rid of his misogynistic jokes basically negates a huge chunk of his growth within the story. So it feels very rushed. The creators themselves said that Aang's journey to save the world wouldn't have that many sidetracks and would be more focused and mature. Sure, the audience that watched the original series are all adults now, but that playfulness of Aang was super important for him to evolve as a character. Taking that out and making it more brutal and more Game of Thrones like, it kinda takes away the very essence that allowed us kids to identify with him. Now some of the other changes that I noticed are pretty much the result of having one too many pink hair ladies in the writers room, like changing the mayor of Kyoshi village from a guy to a woman, or changing the story of the secret lovers from Omashu to a lesbian relationship. Sure, minor details you say. Plus, I love lesbians, I've watched a lot of their movies, fine. But what's not a minor detail is making Kiyoshi the first avatar Aang encounters. It's canon throughout the series that the avatars can connect with their previous lives in order to gain knowledge and guidance. And in the case of Aang, what makes Avatar Roku, his previous incarnation from the Fire Nation so important, is that he brings a big sense of gravitas to the story. Given that the Fire Nation started the war, who better than his firebender past life to guide him? But the lesbians in charge of this episode couldn't resist the fact that just before Roku, there was the ultimate avatar girl boss, Kyoshi. Who needs an ancient white bearded man who rides a dragon when you have this unit of a female to kick the butts of Shao's men, which is another thing that changed. It was Suko and his men who attacked the village, but whatever. They even changed the first manifestation of the avatar state that Aang channels, which was Roku in his temple in season 1 not Kyoshi, who doesn't manifest herself until season 2. Now that's not something you change by accident, that was intentional fucking pandering, but not strange, from the woman responsible for the latest adaptation of Percy Jackson. Other characters also felt poorly adapted, whether in terms of casting or how they were portrayed. Boomy in the show is a weird character in that he appears as just an old man, but he's actually an earthbending juggernaut, even at his age, who still considers Aang to be his friend and gives him some encouraging words after meeting him after the 100 years. In the adaptation though, he's very fucking cringe. He has that quirk with his mouth where he smacks his lips real quick and the changes to his relationship with Aang are so big it presents Bumi as resenting Aang for disappearing and leaving everyone to deal with the war. And this dark tone that the showrunners decide to put in the show just feels really off. And then you got Team Azula. First of all, what the fuck did they do with Mei? What did they feed that girl? Same as Asula. Tai Li is the only one that looks apart, but you can barely see her given how much of the screen the other two take up. One of the things that's going around is people saying how the show finally acknowledges Asula's mental abuse by Osai and how she's being shown in a more sympathetic light. The problem is, she shouldn't be shown under a more sympathetic light. She's a fucking psychopath. The reason why Asula can control lightning so easily as opposed to Iroh, is not because of a mastery of her inner peace, but because of her absence of feeling. She doesn't care to kill to get what she wants, she's extremely self-centered and Osai favors her over Suko because she's the spitting image of her father, a heartless, murderous villain unlike his brother who is more like their mother. And when everyone turns on her at the end for being an absolute psychopath, it's not strange that she has a mental breakdown, because she ripped what she saw, so she should be portrayed as a ruthless killer, because that's what she really is. All these changes are not surprising though, given that the original creators left the adaptation due to creative differences. Articles saying that they wanted to portray a more serious tone in the show, like Game of Thrones, which everyone thought was absolutely ridiculous, because Avatar is nothing like Game of Thrones. Not everything has to be Game of Thrones. Have you seen how that show ended? Season ever. <laughs> to wrap this up, the new Avatar is not a bad adaptation. They couldn't fuck it up more than what M. Night Shyamalan did, the bar wasn't even low, it was literally on the ground. They nailed some aspects of it, with some of the character castings, massive improvements to the bending CGI and choreography, but they couldn't resist adding that little bit of pandering in there, cause fuck yeah, girl power. They had to cut a lot of what made the show great, the little adventures that made us care for Team Avatar, which in turn made everyone call this show soulless. And it kinda is. The pretty good looking show, with none of the heart, made sorely to rack up money. 
Don't you find it strange that we live in such a progressive era, yet all that Hollywood seems to be doing is bringing back more and more stories from the past and refurbishing them to fit the modern times, which, more often than not, fucking sucks. I've seen a lot of dumb people on Twitter saying that media literacy is dead, but to me, after seeing more and more live action adaptations being announced every day, I believe that the one not showing many signs of life nowadays is creativity. But if you watch this fine video, leave us a like. Thank you to my supporters over at Coffee. you guys yeah, are baby. the best. Check out this video next if you want to see the movie with the sexiest fascist. Let me know in the comments down below what you think about the new avatar. Do you think it's good? Do you think it's soulless? And as always, I've been at your home the video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.